1 Corinthians 4 verses 6 to 13 says, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. For who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. Without us you have become kings. And with that you did reign, so that we might share the rule with you. For I think that God has exhibited us apostles as last of all, like men sentenced to death, because we have become a spectacle to the world, to angels, and to men. We are fools for Christ's sake, but you are wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are held in honor, but we in disrepute. To the present hour we hunger and thirst, we are poorly dressed and buffeted and homeless, and we labor, working with our own hands. When reviled, we bless, when persecuted, we endure, when slandered, we entreat. We have become, and are still, like the scum of the world, the refuse of all things. Alex Haley said, whenever, anytime you see a turtle up on top of a fence post, you know he had some help getting there. It's a good idea for people to be humble about their accomplishments. Uh, most of the time they had some help along the way. And even if they didn't, if they did something all by themselves, they should at least thank God that they had the ability to do that. I would bet everybody in this room would say, you know someone who is conceited, egotistical, self-absorbed, conceited. How many of you? Raise your hand. I, I don't want to always do the participation thing, but I just would like to see a show of hands of those of you who know somebody conceited in your family. All right. How about... All right, anybody in your pew? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll let you take that up with them afterward. But conceited people mo rub most of us the wrong way. One of my earliest memories of really being annoyed by someone who was conceited was when I was turned down by a girl for a date in high school. I thought she was one of the sweetest girls at school. Her name was Susie. And we were in a public speaking class together and we got along magnificently. We, you know, he divided us into groups in the class and had us work on different projects together. And we had this great friendship, this banter going on, and it was just so fun. We really seemed to enjoy each other's company. Well, Susie was um, a senior. I was a junior. She was stunningly beautiful. She looked like a model. She was wildly popular in the school. I was relatively unknown, so I thought I should ask her out. I have so much in common. Well, when I did, here's what she said to me. It's etched in my memory. She said, it's no joke. <laughs> she said, that is so cute. That really is. Thank you for asking, Tim, but I'm dating a guy who's in college, but that was so sweet of you. Now, that may not sound conceited, but the tone of her voice made it sound like she was talking like I was some seven-year-old kid who had a crush on a celebrity. And it was like she was saying, you know, that's really cute that you, you, thought you had any chance of dating me. I, I, that's cute. Well, I never talked to her again. <laughs> I got into a different group. Then forget this business. Well, a friend of mine who was in her class went to their 45th year class reunion last year, and he showed me a picture of her. And if, if I were superficial and immature, I would say... <laughs> 
that the years have not been kind to Susie. <laughs> and on top of that, I have Cindy. <laughs> Pride is so offensive to us. None of us are attracted to people who are full of themselves. And, but according to Scripture, pride is also one of the greatest affronts and offenses to God. And I think I could make a case that at the foundation or core of every sin, at least in my life anyway, that pride, the sin of pride was either obvious or it was subtle, but it was there. And we, you think of how we see this kind of arrogance and haughtiness in our world today. We see it among athletes, other celebrities, politicians, preachers. We live in a world that encourages and even rewards pride, yet all of us would say we're kind of drawn to people when we see some humility in them at the same time. In this passage that we're in, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 6 to 13, uh, the Apostle Paul kind of takes the church at Corinth to the woodshed over their spiritual pride. The church was having problems with disunity, and any time you have disunity in a church, it is guaranteed that pride is either very obvious or lurking in the background somewhere, but pride is involved. Pride is a unity killer in a church. And it's, you, you'll find if there's disunity, somebody or a group of people, they are dealing with this dysfunctional pride at work, this pitfall of pride in themselves. And you heard the scripture that was read on the video, but we're going to be going through verses 6 to 13 of chapter 4 as we go through the sermon. So if you have your Bibles, I'd love for you to keep your, your Bibles open as I'll be referring to it. But just so you can know, if, if you like to fill in the blanks along the way in the, the uh, bulletin that you received when you came in, here's, here's the track we're going to be following. Uh, the point is be an example of a humble spirit to maintain unity. That's the main point I see Paul getting at in this passage. He's telling them, be an example of a humble spirit to maintain unity. And here are the, the supporting points that I see him develop here. Follow the humble example of others. Number two, be humble about what we have been given. Three, be humble enough to need others. And four, be humble enough to suffer to reach others. That's how we can be an example of a humble spirit to maintain unity. First of all, follow the humble example of others. All of us should surround ourselves with people who have a genuinely humble spirit and then follow their example. Back in the 1930s in Vienna, Austria, there was a caretaker who was taking a group of English tourists through the historic home of Ludwig von Beethoven. And it was the house where Beethoven lived and did some of his most marvelous works. And in that group of tourists was a young woman who was in her 20s, and she thought of herself as being a very good pianist, and she was. And so she asked the, the caretaker if uh, they could see the room where Beethoven's piano was. And the caretaker brought the group to that room, and he took the cover off of the piano very carefully, and he said to them, here, my friends, is the instrument where Beethoven sat down to compose some of his greatest works. Well, while he was talking, the young woman, who had asked about it, pushed her way to the front and ran up to it and sat on the stool and started playing this piano, playing one of his most beautiful sonatas. And she did a great job. After she was done, she whirled around on the stool and she said, you know, I'll bet that you have a lot of people who who want to play this instrument, don't you? And the caretaker said, well, miss, um, last summer, Ignacy Jan Paderewski was here. Paderewski had been a very famous pianist and composer in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And by this time, that would have been, he said some years ago, I think he said 10 years ago in, in the 20s, he would, would have been in his 70s. And the caretaker said that in, he was in that some of the people asked Paderewski to play the piano. And Paderewski's response was, no, I'm not worthy to play this piano. The article didn't say it, but I would bet there was some awkward silence 
because this 20-year-old just thought she did deserve to play that. And I'm sure she regretted it later on. And most of us, if you're like me, uh, you, you have an active conscience and you, you look back at times when you were being prideful because you were and doing something and we regret those times, or we should. But some people never grow out of that prideful spirit. And so we need to find people around us who have a humble spirit and follow their example. And apparently in the church in Corinth, there were those who had, they were bragging about their spiritual power and authority and claiming that they had such spiritual depth. And they just thought everybody else was on a lower level, apparently. And, and yet you remember from last week, if you were here last week, we looked at verses 1 to 5, and that's where Paul said that, you know, Apollos and Cephas, who's Peter and I, we were just, we're servants. And the word that he used, if you remember, was the word for under rowers, the, the lowest of the low uh, galley slaves working, pulling oars on the bottom of these massive ships. And Paul's saying, that's what we are. That's all we are. And he was holding, he said, you know, in verse 6, look at this again. He said, I have applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, brothers, that you may learn by us. That means following their example. Not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. The word for puffed up meant full of hot air. Bernie Frank told me last week that he was in a church Sorry, I forgot to ask your permission to share this, Bernie. Uh, he, he said he was at a church in, in the men's restroom. It had one of those dryers, hand, the air dryers to dry your hands after you wash. And above it was a sign that said, for a replay of last Sunday's sermon, push the button. <laughs> mean bunch of people. Paul was stressing to his readers that no one who's in Christ has any legitimate reason for being puffed up or full of hot air. Paul, Apollos, and Cephas, they provided an example of humility for them to follow. Secondly, be humble about what we have been given. Verse 7, he started to get a little sarcastic, and which I love, and he because he, I, I think I have that gift. And he said, for who sees anything different in you. In other words, when he says, who sees anything different in you? He's saying, what makes you so unique and so special? Who do you think you are? Do you think you're God's gift of the church? Then he said, what do you have that you did not receive? If you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? And one of the pitfalls of pride is when we forget that everything we have comes from God. Everything. In the church in Corinth, they were so full of pride about their knowledge and their spiritual gifts. Think about some of the things people brag about and get puffed up about. You know, intelligence, yes, some people are absolute geniuses. And they have an amazing memory of facts that, that they've studied. But God is the one who gave them the ability to remember those things, and he can take that away from them at any time. Some get puffed up about their wealth. You know, after Job lost everything he had, remember what he said in Job 121, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job knew that anything he had, it had been given to him by God. It wasn't his. Beauty is something people get puffed up about. And some of us are just naturally beautiful. We can't help it. We, uh, you know, others of you, you beg for mercy, I know, and you try to, you want to become like us and dare to dream. But people fall in to this pitfall of pride over their beauty and attractiveness, and God can take it away in an instant or over time like he did with Susie. <laughs> but I've moved on. <laughs> That people become prideful about possessions. Back in 1994, I had to drive from where we lived in Michigan City 
to uh, Belleville, Illinois, which is near St. Louis. Uh, about five years prior, or about six years prior to that, we had moved from Belleville up to Michigan City, and so we still had our home there because it wasn't a good time to sell, so we had been renting it out. Well, now we decided we're going to sell the home. So I had to drive down to Belleville, it's a five-hour drive, and paint the house to get it ready to sell. And we had two cars, but only one of them would be dependable enough to make that drive. And my, my wife needed the dependable car because she's my wife and driving the kids around. And, you know, she needed to get them to their places and she needed the seat space also. So I had to borrow a car from a guy in our church whose name was Neil. And it wasn't just any car. It was a beautiful brown 1993 Firebird with a T-top. And it was loaded. And I drove that car down Interstate 55 in Illinois on a nice summer day. People were driving by, giving me a thumbs up. And I'm just so proud of my car. <laughs> and, you know, I stopped at restaurants and people would come up and comment on the car and want to look at it. And I just acted like it was mine. And then I got to where I was going back down to Belleville. And when I got there, some of the people I know, uh, you, you know from the church there were, were complimenting the car, and they said, is that yours? I mean, like they knew I was a youth minister. So I, I had to tell them, you know, I borrowed it from a friend, and one of the guys from there said, what kind of car do you drive? And I said, a vet. And I, I said, a Chevette. <laughs> uh, I, I was so proud of driving Neil's car down the interstate, but I was reminded, this isn't mine. I'm borrowing this. It's on loan to me. It's, it's me. In a similar way, everything we have, everything comes from God. If you have a spiritual gift, all of us do. Every Christian has some spiritual gift. It's from him. All of your possessions, whatever you've done to earn it, it's from him. James 1.17 says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights. We need to be humble about any abilities or spiritual gifts that we have. To be humble about what we've been given. Thirdly, be humble enough to need others. In verse 7, he said, you know, I, I said in verse 7 that he started out a little sarcastic. Well, in verse 8, his sarcasm kicks into full speed. And I think it's holy sarcasm. And the Lord is using his sarcasm to hopefully convict these people. And, and here just, uh, you know... Th uh, few ways that, that he was getting onto them, their self-satisfaction. Look at verse 8. Already you have all you want. Some of you think you have it all, he's saying. You have nothing more to learn. Verse 8. Already you've become rich. Without us, you've become kings. When people are self-sufficient and think that they have arrived, they think they're the exceptional ones and they want to rule the church and they don't want to submit to any authorities they, they see themselves as kings or queens of the church and that the church needs them to be in positions of power in, instead of serving they want to rule because they have all the answers and paul wanted them to know they had not yet spiritual maturity and the proof of that was in how they thought they had arrived he said we need to be humble enough to know that we need other people in the church. And as the saying goes, the ground is level at the foot of the cross. All of us need to display a teachable spirit that we need each other. in the church. And lastly, be humble enough to suffer to reach others. A good sign, he said he thinks that, that God put him and the other apostles on display at the end of a line, like the, a spectacle, made a spectacle of them. And this was a reference to the Roman triumph parade when a, a Roman general won a great victory for Rome. He would bring back all of the spoil of 
that victory. And, and his, uh, they would have a parade for the, this general and his soldiers and coming through the main streets in, in Rome. And they would carry all of the wealth that they'd captured. At the end of the parade was a group of slaves who were bound in chains. These were prisoners of war. And everyone knew to go to the parade, to that arena afterwards because these slaves were going through the streets toward the arena and they were going to have to try to fend off these wild beasts, lions, and they always lost. And Paul's saying, isn't this something? You Corinthians see yourselves as being among the elites up there at the front of the parade, yet we who are apostles, we're back here condemned to die. And he's saying, please tell me what it's like to be so amazing. The word for spectacle that he used was the word theatron, where we get our word theater from. He, he was saying that they were a source of entertainment and ridicule for unbelievers. In verse 10, he showed that how the world viewed these Corinthians versus how they, they viewed the apostles. He said, we are fools for Christ, but you are wise in Christ. In other words, you see yourselves and those around you see you as so smart, but that's not how they see us. Paul said, we are weak, but you are strong. Paul's writing this from prison in Ephesus uh, while they were living in the comfort of their own homes. And the apostles suffered socially. Paul said, you are held in honor and we are held in disrepute. And then in verses 12 to 13, Paul spoke of how the apostles respond to the hatred of the world. He says, we experience hunger and thirst for the work of the gospel, and we are poorly dressed, beaten, sometimes homeless. We work hard with our hands, and people slander us, and we bless them. People think of us as scum. We're the scum of the earth in the eyes of people. But you guys just elevate yourself so much. His attitude was, when it came to any of his accomplish accomplishments, that he would have been like a turtle on a fence post. That's how he saw himself. As we try to reach more and more people around here, it probably won't result in us suffering physical persecution where we're at, thankfully. Might come to that in our country. Right now, no. But are we willing to suffer to the extent that we're willing to give up some things? What are you and I willing to give up if it means we'll be able to reach more people? For Paul, he was called to give up a lot of comforts. And many of the apostles were called to do that. We're called to suffer to reach people as well. What are we giving up? And it, it may be what people think of us. It may be personal preferences that will help us reach more people. Are we willing to be humble enough to suffer in order to reach more people? You may have heard of a great preacher and defender of the Christian faith named Nabil Qureshi. Nabil's parents <clears throat> immigrated to the United States from Pakistan. And Nabil was raised as a Muslim, and he wasn't a nominal Muslim. He loved and was absolutely devoted to Islam. And he wanted to be a doctor, and he wound up through different you know, degree, stages of schooling, he wound up going to Duke's universe, Duke University's medical center. And while he was there in medical school, he was paired up as a roommate with a Christian man named David Wood. And David was very bold about his faith in Jesus. And he began to, to uh, challenge Nabil about Islam. And Christianity, and about the Bible versus the Quran, about Jesus versus Muhammad. And Nabil said he became angry about this. He got angry at David, and so he decided he was going to study the Bible in order to prove the Bible is full of errors. He ended up becoming impressed with the integrity and truth of Scripture. And the more he read about Jesus, the more he was impressed by his holiness and his character and his teachings when compared with Muhammad. And he said that it began to churn within him, and, and he said, I started asking myself, is it possible 
if all that I'm reading here about Jesus is true, could it be that he did die on the cross and rise from the dead? And he knew that if he accepted the teachings of the Bible about Jesus, he would not only have to give up his Muslim faith, but his parents, his relatives, and his friends would count him as dead. And they would have nothing to do with him. It was turned his whole world upside down. And so he began to pray. And he said that he prayed, God, if this is true, please show it to me in a vision. And Muslims are very big and taught that God reveals himself through visions and dreams. And Nabil said that he had a dream in which he saw a very narrow door. And as he peeked through the door, he could see this beautiful, large banquet room, the brightly lit banquet room, and this massive table with a bunch of food on it. And around the table were his Christian friends that he had been meeting. He wasn't a Christian yet, obviously, but he'd been meeting with David and these other Christians. He saw them all around this table of food, but they weren't eating anything. They're just sitting there. And he said the dream bothered him so much that he went to his roommate, David, and he said, he told him about this weird dream. And when he told David about the dream, David said, oh, Nabil, that's easy to interpret. That narrow door is Jesus. He's the one and only way. The brightly lit banquet hall and the table filled with food is, is heaven, the kingdom of God. And we were all there. We weren't eating yet because we're waiting on you. And Nabil was so convicted that he gave his life to Jesus and he was baptized into Christ. And after he was baptized, isn't that a great picture? After he was baptized, Nabil became so bold in sharing his faith, and he knew, he knew that he would be able to convince his family and friends who were Muslims if he had the opportunity. And so he went with his roommate David to Dearborn, Michigan, to a Muslim convention that was taking place there. And if you know anything about Dearborn, Michigan, the very heavy a Muslim population there. So he went to this convention and he walked around, all around the convention area outside wearing a t-shirt that said, ask me about Jesus. And he got in so many conversations, especially with teenagers and young adults about Christianity and, and Islam and, and Jesus. And amazingly, here in one of our United States, he and David Wood were arrested for disturbing the peace by teaching people about Jesus. And they took them to a Detroit jail and they separated them. They put David on one end of the hall uh, uh, the, with you know, cells in between them. They put him in a cell at one end of the jail hall and Nabil in the cell on the other end with other prisoners in between them. And he was so discouraged, and he began wondering, what had he done that was wrong? And he said he remembered reading, I mean, he's exploring the Bible, and he said he remembered reading in the book of Acts, and it's in chapter 16, he said, where Paul and Silas were in prison for preaching the gospel, and they weren't having a pity party. They started singing and praising God, and they ended up leading the Philippian jailer to Christ and baptizing him that night. So Nabil thought, maybe he and David are supposed to be there to witness to these other prisoners, maybe. And so Nabil yelled to David, David, why are you in jail? And David said, I don't know, why are you in jail? And Nabil said, I'm here for telling people about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And David caught on to what he was doing. And David responded saying, really? Well, tell me, what is the gospel of Jesus Christ? And so he went on and preached the gospel. And they had a dialogue for 20 minutes, he said, about Jesus. They had a captive audience. I never, said he never knew whether anything came of that but with those guys. But Nabil went on to have an incredible ministry of leading Muslim people to Jesus. And he wrote a book called Seeking Allah and Finding Jesus. The story has a sad ending. Is several years ago, uh, on August 30th, 
2016, Nabil was diagnosed with a very advanced form of stomach cancer. And then after several painful surgeries and treatments, he died on September 8th, 2017, seven years ago from last Sunday, at the age of 34. I, I, I don't understand all that, but God used him, even if just for a short time. And through this book and other books, still using him. But a question for us to consider is this. Are we willing to step up and take his place? Maybe not reach in the Muslim community. We may not be able to do that like he did. But are we willing to step up and take his place and make whatever sacrifice is necessary to reach 34,000 people in a six-mile radius of us who are unchurched? What are we willing to give up? And we need to pray daily that God will help us to grow in humility, willing to sacrifice, to sacrifice to reach other people. And that requires a humble spirit, and we should pray every day for that, because as James quotes Proverbs, God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. We're going to ask you to stand and we're going to sing a song of uh, invitation. And during this time, we would invite you to uh, come forward. And maybe you've been a Christian for years, but you have been drifting and you want to recommit yourself to following Jesus and would like us to pray with you. We would love to pray for you about that. If you've never become a Christian and you want to know, how you can be right with God. If you aren't sure where you stand with Him, but want to be right with Him, we'd love for you to come as well. And we'll be happy to talk with you about that. You deserve to know what it means to be a Christian. We want to look at that scripture together with you about how He wants us to respond. But maybe you have been a Christian, but you've not landed at a church home yet. And if you've been baptized into Jesus Christ, given your life to him, and you want to place membership here, we invite you to come and confess his name and become a member along with us in serving him at First Christian. Whatever your decision is, we would invite you to make it. If you want to make it public, just come forward. I'd be glad to greet you. But we should all be reflecting on this and praying that God will help us to have the humility maintain a unity in the church and to reach more people for him. Would you come while we sing?